Welcome first graders to the Dallas Independent School District STEM Environmental Education Center. And we'd like to give a special welcome to a number of schools who are with us today. Uh, first are the students at Skyview Elementary in Richardson ISD. Um, we also have the students from Gabe P. Allen Elementary and that's right here in the Dallas Independent School District. We have students from Indian Creek Elementary in Southwest ISD, which is in the San Antonio area. And then all from Dallas ISD, we have Annie Webb Blanton, M.B. Henderson, and last but certainly not least, the students at Marcellus STEAM Academy. Thank you, much for, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. If you are watching this and have not registered for this field trip yet, you can still do that. Uh, how you register for this field trip is you go to www.tiny.cc slash EEC register to get yourself or your class registered for this field trip. We just use that information for our attendance purposes. Today's uh, virtual field trip is going to be all about force and motion. During this virtual field trip, students will discover that force, motion, and energy are related and are part of everyday life. Students will predict how a magnet can be used to push or pull an object and observe the ways that objects can move. So we're gonna start off this trip by exploring forces with Mrs. Fuller. Next, you're gonna see how magnets work with Mr. Monroe. Third, we're going to describe the location of objects um, compared to other objects with Ms. Nash. And last, we're going to see ways objects move with Mr. Ramirez. While we're doing all of that, you can ask us questions. Since this is a virtual field trip, the way you ask us questions is you go to www.tiny.cc slash EEC dash question dash answer. And there you'll fill out a very short form. Um, and once you click submit, that will send us any questions you have related to force and motion. You can ask as many questions as you like and we will do our best to answer all of them in the time that we have with you this afternoon. So let me sh stop sharing my screen here so we can get started with the actual trip. Uh, Mrs. Fuller is going to lead us through that exploration of forces. Hi boys and girls. Well, good afternoon, first grade. I brought my little friend to work with me today. This is Lauren the chicken, and we're gonna be talking about three big words, energy, forces, and motion. And she's gonna be a object lesson for us today. So this morning, she flew up on my desk. She can fly a little bit. And she laid an egg on my desk right behind my computer. Can you believe that? And so my question is, how did she do that? How did she fly? How did she run over to my desk to start flying? How did she lay an egg? It all goes to energy. There's energy inside of her body that she gets from the food she eats. So I'm gonna show you one of the things that she likes to eat is a worm. Can you see that worm right there? So we're gonna see if she wants to eat the worm to get more in it. Whoa, she did. <laughs> I'm gonna put her down. All right, there you go. Here you go. I'm gonna throw the rest of the worms on the floor for her. So she'll be a happy girl. So when we talk about energy, what is energy? Energy is the ability to do work. So the work the chicken does is she runs, she scratches on the ground, she flies a little bit, she makes eggs, and she lays eggs, and all that takes energy. She gets her energy from the food she eats. We get our energy from the food we eat. But almost all the energy that we use here on our planet Earth comes from the sun, our star. And it gives us heat energy, sometimes we call that thermal energy, and it gives us light energy. And that light energy is what uh, green plants use to carry on photosynthesis to make the food that we eat. So let's talk about how the energy and force and motion are all related to each other. So let's talk first about force. Well, what's force? Well, force is pulling and pu pushing. So a force, a force is something that can make things move. So if you think about it, uh, it can start motion, it can stop motion, it can slow motion down, it can speed motion up, it can change the direction of something that's in motion, Force is very powerful and it's very evident every day. 
everything we do. Um, an object that's set in, uh, set in motion by forces, it can be set in motion by direct contact. So if I took my hand and I pushed the, the yellow school bus, that's direct contact. I'm directly touching it with my hand, pushing it back and forth. So that's one. One is moving air. So here's a, it's not a real anemometer. It's sort of like a toy one to demonstrate, but I'm gonna blow on it. Let's see what happens. It turned around. The, the wind, the force of air coming from my lungs got caught in the little cups and it made the anemometer spin. So that was force, the force of wind. Okay, moving there. All right, and uh, Mr. Monroe, the man who's gonna come after me, he's gonna talk about the force magnets uh, have on objects that have iron in them, pushing and pulling. Magnets are very powerful also. And another one that we're gonna demonstrate right here on the table in just a minute, is the force of gravity. Gravity is the force that keeps you and me stuck to the planet keeps us from floating out into outer space. But when we drop things, it also pulls those things to the ground. It's got a very strong force and gravity is, uh, is uh, one of the forces that we're going to demonstrate in just a minute. So there's another force called friction and friction is one of the things that sh uh, slows us down. So like if you're driving in the car and the person driving the car puts on the brakes, it's the friction of the foot against the pedal, against the mechanism in the car, against the brakes, against the wheel, against the road, all that friction slows it down. And friction, we're gonna demonstrate friction here on this tabletop in just a second too. So let's look at this. Let's start off with, uh, oh, and let's talk about motion. What is motion? Motion is very simple. All motion is, is moving. So we're gonna show you some things that move. Let's start off with pushing. Here's the, our little school bus. I'm gonna push it, direct contact with my hand, push it. And that pushing is a force. Here's another one. Here's a little ant who's on a skateboard. I have a little string and I'm gonna pull him. Pulling is a force as well. So we've got him back here and let's pull him. Can you see that? He's coming straight at you. All right, and I'm gonna pull him back toward me. Whoa, he almost went off the road. All right, so that was push and pull and both with direct contact. Okay, here's another one. We were talking about gravity. You remember us talking about gravity? Well, here's a pause patrol fire truck right here. I'm gonna pause. I'm gonna pause him up here at the top. Whoops, he looks like he's fixing to take off. And gravity is gonna pull him down this ramp. It's a force, a pulling force. So I am going to touch him. I'm not gonna push him. I'm just gonna release him because he's got his wheels caught back. Did you see that? So that pulling, pulling by gravity, pulled the pause patrol fire truck down to the end. And why did he stop? Well, he stopped because he ran into this sign that says motion. So force can stop things as well as cause them to go. So they can stop it, they can start it, they can speed it up, they can slow it down, they can change its direction. So forces are very powerful. Okay, I've got another one I wanna show you. I think I've got just enough time to show you this one. This is a different kind of motion. All these other motions I showed you were straight. They just went straight. This is gonna be circular motion. And I'm gonna do it by pulling my, my fingers together like that on this little stick and it's gonna start this top and it's gonna go in a circle. So here we go. Look at that. So that, that pushing of my fingers against the little stick started the circular motion. And it's not gonna go on like that for infinity because friction, the friction of the top in contact with the table here is gonna slowly slow it down 
and the minute it's gonna start to wobble and then it's gonna stop. So we've got our three big words, energy, force, and motion. They're all related. They all have something to do with each other. And we've got all three of those in our life every single day. So this, there it goes and it came to a stop. Mr. Broughton will answer any questions you have. Have a delightful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Fuller. The question that came in was, uh, where is gravity strongest? And gravity would be strongest in our solar system on the sun because the sun by far is the largest object in our solar system. Uh, second would be Jupiter because that is the largest planet in the solar system. And as you go down to smaller and smaller planets, the gravity becomes weaker and weaker. So um, on Earth, gravity is stronger than on the moon because the Earth is um, about six times more massive than the moon. All right, now we're going to discuss how magnets work with Mr. Monroe. I, th I think you're muted. How about that? Okay, students, now we're ready to go with our investigation of magnets. And I don't know whether you all realize that magnets, we depend on them or we use them in our everyday lives. Every day, something is using a magnet because magnets are amazing. They have a magnetic field that does create a force field. A, a magnetic force can cause motion of some objects simply because of the matter that is found in that object. If a bit of uh, iron or steel is found in the matter or the makeup of an object, it can be affected by a magnet. Well, let's talk about the magnets. The most common magnets that you probably know about are probably the bar magnet, which looks like this. A horseshoe magnet, which looks like this, a big U. And a ring magnet that looks like this, like a donut with a hole in it, okay? Now, they do come in different sizes. I'm pretty sure that there are bar magnets that are bigger than this. There are horseshoe magnets that are bigger than this and probably smaller too because this is also a bar magnet <laughs> and this is a tiny horseshoe magnet. The thing that they have all alike is that the strongest point of attraction where they have the strongest force field or the strongest strength is found in the poles of that magnet. And what we mean by poles if we look at this bar magnet, and I don't know whether you can see it or not, but at this end, there's an end that stands for the North Pole of this magnet. And at this end, that is the S that stands for the South Pole. With a horseshoe magnet, each end, this particular end that I'm pointing at has an S for the South Pole. This one has an N for the North Pole. And with the ring magnet, one side would be the South Pole. The other side would be the North Pole. So you probably know all about the North and South Pole by simply looking at the planet Earth. We live on the planet Earth and often we refer to the top part of our planet as the North Pole. It's cold up there all the time, isn't it? We also refer to the bottom of our planet as being the South Pole. So you know, our planet, the planet Earth, could be considered very similar to a very large magnet. And we'll discuss that a little later on in the lesson. Now, magnets have the ability to attract or pull certain objects because of that object having a content of iron or steel in its matter. Now, we're gonna use some objects to do a little test on. And it's much like something that goes on in a salvage yard or a wrecking yard. You know, when a car gets 
wrecked and it can't be fixed, they usually end up in a big wrecking yard, a salvage yard. And when they're in that big wrecking yard or salvage yard, the metals that are in that car have to be separated because they get to be recycled. Well, they have a very large magnet that they work with that's tied to a crane similar to this. And that electromagnet that is on the end of a cable can come down to a pile of scrap metal, stoves and old refrigerators and wrecked cars and it'll pick up certain pieces of metal because that metal that it's picking up has iron or steel in its makeup. And then it can move that metal to a similar pile of the same type of makeup iron and steel makeup and that's one way that they separate we're going to do a little separating ourselves i'm going to put a nail in this petri dish i'm going to put a brad man that's kind of gold colored so i don't know what that's going to do i'm going to put a rock okay a piece of rock i'm even going to put a penny Oh, let's see, what else do I have in this pile here? I'm going to also put a paper clip. I'm going to put a plastic paper clip. I'm going to put a screw. A screw. And I'm going to put a pop top from a soda can. And I'm going to take this little, well, let's see, one more item. Let's see, I think I'll put one of these beads that came from a necklace. And I'm going to see which items the magnet is going to pick up. Wow, it jumped right up in there. Let's see what else. Wow, look, it did pick up some of the items and it did drop one right there. I guess it picked up too much for its strength. Pretty strong though. And we can see that it left some items. So the items that are attracted to the magnet, which it pulled them up, it was stronger than even the force of gravity that would pull them down. So evidently there are some iron and there's some steel in the makeup of those items. The screw, the nail, the bead. <laughs> okay. Now, what it did leave was the rock. It left the penny, and I had a feeling it was going to leave the penny because pennies are made out of a metal called copper. It didn't pick up the plastic either. It didn't pick up this piece of metal, which is very surprising. This is a pop top from a soda can, and you know what? I believe they're made out of aluminum, and aluminum is a metal that we do a little, a lot of recycling of. Okay, so. That's one way that they are used to pick up or separate metal. And they use a pulling action, which we call an attraction. But you know what? Magnets also can use a pushing force, especially when they are dealing with each other. Take, for example, these two bar magnets. You heard me talk about the poles earlier. The N stands for the North Pole. N stands for the North Pole and the S stands for the South Pole. If I put these two bar magnets together, North Pole facing the North Pole, and try to get them to attract each other, they won't do it. They're pushing against each other. They are repelling each other. They won't go together. Now, if I turn this one around and take the South Pole and put it next to the North Pole, Look what happened. They attract each other. Isn't that something? Same way with this ring magnet. Now, I have a shaft here, and there's two ring magnets down here. And I don't know whether the north or south pole is facing up, but let's see what happens when I put a third ring on there. Oh, it wouldn't go down, would it? And gravity is not strong enough to pull it all the way down, it bounces right back up. So probably, most likely, this must be like poles. And they're 
pushing against one another. So one-way magnets attract, pulling two, and the other way is they repel each other if light poles are facing each other, and that's the push force. You know, as you get older, you're gonna find out that magnets are used in our everyday lives. Take, for example, maybe you've gone on a camping trip or a hiking trip with your family. If not, maybe sometime in the future you will. And you guys will find out there's a very important tool that most people carry with them to keep from being lost. It's called a compass. It's something like this. I've got a bigger example. We'll talk about it for a little bit. And on that compass, you will see N that stands for North, E that stands for East, and S that stands for South, and W that stands for West. Well, a compass is used because the needle that's inside that compass, that needle that's going to tell you what direction you're going is a magnet. Now, that magnet, that needle, the red part of that needle is going to face or going to point toward the north. If I'm holding my compass right here and I know that in my lab, I know which way north is from here. North is that direction, okay? That direction. And I can look at this compass right now and guess where the red needle is pointing? It's pointing that direction. And just to show you that a magnet's needle is, I mean, a compass's needle is a magnet, I made a homemade compass right here. And what you're seeing right here is a magnet that I have tied to a stick or measuring stick out here and it's suspended and I can see it already trying to work its way around and it's trying to work its way around so that this will point to the north and it's kind of swinging I'm going to stop it swinging I'll even give it a little spin help you guys out now that force that I pushed that was a push for with me pushing now watch what happened it's going to get pulled the other way See it being pulled the other way? It's gonna slow down. And then guess what's gonna happen? It's gonna come back the other way. It's trying to find north. It's gonna come back the other way now. See how it's working? It's gonna come back. Back. Remember which way I said was north? It's working its way back. I said north was that direction. It's almost there. There. It's about there. But, you know, this compass would work like this compass would work. But what would really mess it up is if there was something else, another magnet in the area. Watch what happens when I bring another magnet that's real close to this rather than using the magnetic north, which is the north pole to draw this magnet. Look what happens. That would mess the whole idea up, wouldn't it? to bring another magnet or something that has magnetism attached to it. And you know, I'm gonna close out with this. You know, I've often wondered who discovered a magnet? And there really hasn't been a, 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 a true name that has come up that has discovered or invented the magnet. I will tell you there are some magnets that are found naturally in nature. And they're not looking like the bar magnet or the horseshoe magnet or the ring magnet. They're actually in rock form like this. It's called magnetite. And magnetite, another name for it, it is called lodestone. There are deposits of this kind of rock found in places all over America, all over the world. But the closest deposits that we have are found in Arkansas and Louisiana. 
Let's see if it has a, see, it has a draw to it too. Okay. Lodestone is a type of magnetite. All right, Stephen, hopefully I've helped you get a good understanding about the magnetic force of a magnet and what magnets are. And eventually you're going to find out that they are used in our everyday lives. Right now, I'm going to turn it back over to Mr. Barton. So if any of you have any questions, he might be able to answer those. Thank you, Mr. Monroe. Uh, we got one question from Ms. Morton's class, which is why do we have gravity? And we have gravity because we have mass. So even your body has gravity, but because um, you are so small compared to the whole planet Earth, you don't, you don't feel the effects of, of the gravity that your body has on anything because the Earth's gravity is so much stronger. It's the pull that you feel. Uh, but we, so really we, anything that has mass has gravity and more mass will equal more gravity. All right, now we're going to go on to uh, where things are located in comparison to other things with Miss Nash. Hello, well, since we're talking about location, I came to my favorite location, which is outside. When we're outside, we can breathe that fresh air, we can enjoy the beauty of nature and think about what's all around us and what's happening. This is my favorite time of year. It's the fall. So the leaves, look at these puddings. They're changing color and they're falling off the trees. And Gravity is pulling them down. The wind is blowing them all around. And they're going to grow new ones in the spring, but right now they're losing their leaves. So the sky above, the ground below, and all around we have our plants and nature, birds, and insects. I don't know if you can see, beh see behind me. I have these purple flowers. They're a native aster. And they're so pretty, and they bloom late, so it's fall, November already, and most of the flowers are gone, over, but not these guys. So luckily for the bees, see that bee right there, because they need to store up some honey for winter. They are taking nectar back to the hive to turn it into honey. Because in the winter time, when the, even these are gone. They're going to need that honey for their energy, like Mrs. Fuller was talking about, so they can stay alive. Okay. Now, plants, the plant made that sugar by using the energy from the sun okay, to make its leaves, its flowers, the nectar. That's where it all starts with the sun. Then, after the flowers, come the seeds. And again, See those little black things? Those are the cute little seeds in this. And those little seeds have stored energy. Birds can eat them. Animals can eat them. We eat them. When we eat popcorn, we're eating seeds. We eat bread, we're eating seeds. It's stored energy so that we can move and do all the kinds of things that we, we need to do. And But the seed is really not for us to eat. That's not what the plant wants. The plant needs it to grow new plants in the spring. So all that stored energy in there is going to sprout up into a new plant. So this is a great time of year to go out to the park or just out in the neighborhood or the schoolyard and sit down and look around. Look at the sky above, the beautiful clouds today, that blue sky, the trees above, the ground below, and the plants and insects and birds all around. I so wish that you could be here to, to uh, enjoy this season with us, but you can do it yourself. I hear that crow. So I'm going to share my screen with some of the things I saw this morning. And go. And okay. So, there was so up above in the sky, there was a, a vulture. Okay. They're soaring high, high. Look how high up in the sky that bird was. See those clouds? They were moving too. But the, the vulture is using the rising heat of the air to get up high, high, high. And then they can soar along. They don't use a lot of energy. They don't really flap their wings hardly at all. 
they're just soaring. And then there is again. See how it's just looking for something dead to eat. It's an important job though, they clean up. In our pond, that solar energy that plants need also can dry up the pond. And I was gonna go closer, but there was a killdeer, a little bird. It was right along the edge looking for bugs and I didn't want to scare them away, so I stayed back. But that pond may dry up in a little bit if we don't get some rain. Here's some more late flowers. This is goldenrod. Hear that crow again behind me? Some more late flowers for the butterflies. I even saw one monarch, but I couldn't get a picture. Most of the monarchs have already gone, but there was one still there. Here's some big fruits. So the plants are making fruits. The, the seeds are inside and other animals can eat it, but also the plants can grow new. This is from a tree, the bodoc tree, a horse apple. Great giant thing, beat your hand. Here's some of those leaves taking, taking on their colors, oak tree, and they're gonna have acorns. They're gonna fall down with gravity, plunk. And the squirrels could eat them, and the birds and the pigs and the deer all like to eat the acorns off these oak trees. Here's some of the flowers that some of those late flowers, the butterflies and the hummingbirds like. All the hummingbirds have already left, but the butterflies are still here. And here are really beautiful flowers. Here's some beautiful red leaves, this little wild pear tree. Those beautiful red ones, aren't those pretty? And some more seeds. So again, the plants grow seeds to grow new plants and the animals are going to eat them, the birds in particular. And the pretty flowers like behind me, they're just covered in butterflies and bees right now. Struggling. So I wish you could be here with us, but even if you can't, you can go to your local park or out in the schoolyard, even just in the neighborhood, and look around and look at the things above you, below you, all around you, and watch what's happening. The leaves right now are falling off. If in the spring and summer, even if the wind blows really hard, they, they, they hang on to the tree. But this time of year, they get loose. And then when the wind blows, that's why they're falling off and falling down with crap. So I'm going to turn it back over to Mr. Broughton and uh, for any questions. Nash, uh, the question that came in was, um, can something be both above and below um, an object? And yes, uh, you could have one branch that's higher than another branch, but lower than a third branch, I think is what the question was getting at. So yes, something can be um, described by two different descriptions um, at one time if it's surrounded by other objects. All right, now we're going to explore how objects move with Ms. Ramirez. Hello, my name is Ms. Ramirez and we're gonna be learning about motion. So motion is just describing how things move. So before we get started talking about motion, we're gonna do a little brain break and we're gonna use our body uh, to learn about different forms of motion. So go ahead and put your arms out straight and we're gonna move your arm up and down sort of like a wave. So wavy is a motion. Now we're gonna do another brain break. Take your left arm, and I remember left because your left hand will make an L, and left starts with the letter L. So take your left um, hand, put it on top of your head, and move it up and down, up and down. Now take your other hand, your right hand, and put it on your stomach. And you're gonna take your hand and move it in a circular motion. So. Now we're gonna do both of those motions together at the same time. And we're gonna see how well coordinated your brain is. So left hand on top, move it up and down. The other hand on your stomach, move it in a circle and see if you can do that at the same time. And it's a little bit easier if you go slow and then see if you can do it super fast. Um, so that's just a way to make sure that your brain um, is energized and um, a nice little brain break. So that's motion. We were able to move parts of our body. So the next thing we're gonna talk about is trajectory. Trajectory is the path an object follows when it's moving. 
So things can move in a straight line. So if you take your hand and make it nice and straight, there's a straight line. Think about when you're at school and your teacher tells you to walk in the hall in a straight line. Things can also move in a zigzag or a wave motion. So if you take your hand or your arm and move it in a zigzag or a wave motion. And then things can also move in a circular path. So if you draw a circle with your hand. So I have a little projectile a rocket and I'm going to uh, fling it into the air and the path that it takes is called its trajectory. Now I know you're not going to be able to see it go all the way, um, but it went up and then it went down. So that's its path or trajectory. The next thing we're going to look at is direction. Direction tells us where is something moving or the direction that it's pointing. So what is it pointing to? So we can describe direction as up. So is something going up? Another word for up is ascend. So think of when you're going up a hill, you can say you are ascending the hill. Something can go down, so down. Uh, so think about when you, after you ascend the hill, you have to go down the hill. So another word for down is descend. And if you think about it this way, when I ride bikes, I don't ride bikes often because it's a lot harder for me than walking. Um, I hate riding my bike up a hill. It's too hard for me, but I love going down a hill because I get to go faster and I don't have to use as much energy uh, to pedal. So ascending and descending down. Things can also move around and around. So think about the wheels on your bike. When you are riding your bike, those wheels are going around and around. Uh, so to demonstrate direction, we're gonna take a look at our slinky friend here. So my slinky friend can go left, it can go right. It can go back and forth, left and right. And we call this motion horizontal. So horizontal is this direction here, left and right. The slinky friend, it's a green little unicorn, can also go up and it can also go down. So when things are going up and down, back and forth, we call that vertical. So horizontal, vertical. And then we have something called speed. So speed is just the rate of motion. So it tells us how fast or slow something's going. So we have some nunchucks here. As I play around with these nunchucks, be thinking about the speed. Is it going fast or slow? Think about trajectory. Is it moving in a straight line, zigzag, or in a circular motion? Think about direction. Are they going up or down? Are they going horizontal? Or are they going vertical? Or are they going round and round? So let me start swinging these. And while I'm doing that, describe the motion. Now, I think these are going pretty fast and they're also going in a circular path or trajectory. Now, since we're talking about speed, I have two animals I'm gonna show you. Uh, the first one, I'm gonna go ahead and just name him Sheldon. I borrowed him from the museum. Uh, but this little turtle here, he's a box turtle. So how fast do you think he can run? Do you think he's a fast animal or a slow animal? So take a look at those short stubby legs and those claws that he uses for digging. Look at his face. He has what we call as a beak, sort of looks like a bird's beak. And he has this heavy shell for protection. So do you think he can run fast? So probably not. So if you see something scary like a predator that might try and eat him, he's not gonna run away. Instead, he's gonna tuck his legs and his head inside his shell and he's a special type of turtle. He can actually close that bottom half of his shell and that's how they get the name box turtle. So there's a little line, it's called a hinge. He can tuck his body inside and he can close that top part of his shell and that's how they get the name box turtle. So there's our slow animal. Now I'm gonna pull out my fast one. This fast one has feathers and she lays eggs. This is Pepper. She's a blue silky chicken. You guys can see her beak just like uh, Sheldon has a beak. Uh, this uh, Pepper has a beak as well, but she has these long legs. So those long legs help her to run super fast. So if she sees a predator, an animal that might eat her, she can run away really fast. And trust me, I know chickens can run super fast. I have seen Mr. Broughton at the end of the day running after his chickens trying to put them up in his chicken pen. And uh, sometimes they run so fast he can't catch them. So they can actually run up to nine miles an hour. So super fun. And you can see she has a wings that flap up 
and down, and they can also go really fast too. Uh, so that was Pepper, our chicken. I'm gonna go ahead and put her up. I think she's had enough for today. And I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Uh, my internet's been acting up today, so hopefully um, it will work. So I'm gonna share my screen. It might take a second for the broadcast to start. So I see my screen is counting down the numbers. Uh, so we'll let it finish counting down. I'm gonna go ahead and open up my Google slideshow and we'll go ahead and start off uh, the presentation. Um, so again, hopefully the presentation loads. It's, there it goes. So again, we talked about straight line or zigzag. Let's look at ant. So observe, a good scientist uses their eyes to observe and look. So look at these ants. Do you think they're moving in a straight line, a zigzag, or a combination of both? So think about when you go outside and you see ants moving along the sidewalk. And then we have a picture of a snake. So that snake, its body is moving in a zigzag or a curvy motion. Our next one is up and down. So take a look at that red yo-yo. If you've ever played with a yo-yo, the yo-yo goes up and down. I was gonna show you a yo-yo today, but I tried over the weekend uh, to learn how to do it and I just couldn't get it to work. So I have not mastered, mastered the technique of yo-yoing. Um, but I'm sure you guys have yo-yos at home. And then the other picture is a whack-a-mole. When I was a kid, I used to go to the arcades and whack-a-mole was one of my favorite games to play. So that little toy uh, mole would pop up and you would have to whack it. And then um, it would also go down in the hole. So you got more points, the more moles you were able to whack. Um, so that's whack-a-mole. I don't know if they still have arcades these days, uh, but that was my favorite game. And then I'm gonna show you a picture of prairie dog going up and down. So listen to those cute noises. Those are going side to side. So you can see those prairie dogs jumping up and jumping down, jumping up and jumping down. So they call this uh, the jump yip. And some scientists, they originally thought that it was an all clear sign. So if they saw a predator, an animal that might eat them, um, after that predator went away, they, would, they thought they were jumping up to say kind of like, yay, the predator's gone. Uh, but now research suggests uh, that they're actually doing the up and down as a way of checking in on their neighbors. So they're trying to count like how many of them are there and how alert they are. So think about when your teacher is taking roll call or attendance in the morning and they call your name. You either raise your hand or you jump up or something to let them know that you're there. Uh, so that's what scientists think that they might be doing with that weird behavior. So our next one, let me see if I can switch my slide and I always miss it. Uh, so this is back and forth. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you the video of a hummingbird drinking nectar. We have lots of hummingbirds out here at the environmental center. So you can see the hummingbird going forward to drink the nectar, nectar and then moving backwards, going forward and then moving backwards. Um, and hummingbirds can actually fly super fast. So you can see their wings going up and down super fast. They can actually beat their wings between 200 and 1,000 times per minute. And their heart, um, sorry, that was their heart, yeah, that was their heart rate. Uh, but they can flap their wings between 500 and 200 times per second. So imagine if you were to flap your arms up and down, how many times could you do that in one second? Um, and then we also have pictures of a rocking horse and a swing going back and forth. I love sitting on my uh, recliner because it rocks back and forth and it helps me go to sleep. And then the other one is rounded round. So things that go in a circle. Again, when I was a kid, I used to go to the fair a lot and I would ride the carousel. And I used to love the carousel, the horse would go up and down, but also the whole ride would take you in a circle round and round. And I used to love those swings where you would sit in the swing and it would propel you in the air and you would go in a circle. And then here's a cute little video of a squirrel trying to steal food from a bird feeder. And this is a special type of bird feeder. It is a, a bird feeder that swings with the weight of the squirrel, and that is to prevent squirrels from stealing the bird food. So a lot of people don't like squirrels because they think they're a pest. Um, so they try to do everything they can to prevent those squirrels from eating the bird food and hanging around. Um, I like squirrels, so I actually feed the squirrels and buy them their own squirrel food. Um, but yeah, definitely some people don't like them. And then my last one, uh, speed. 
take a look and observe these rabbits. Are they going fast? Are they going slow? Are they jumping up? Are they jumping down? Um, what is their trajectory? Do they run in a straight line or are they running all zigzag? So these are cotton tails. They get their name because they have this white uh, fluffy tail that looks like cotton. And when they were jumping up and down, these, are, these rabbits are playing, so they're having a little playtime uh, jumping up and down. Those long legs help them to run super fast. Uh, so there's lots of animals out there that would probably love to eat them for food. And then sometimes you might see the rabbit just standing super still and not moving. They are taking their time to listen. So maybe they heard something and they're trying to determine whether it might be something dangerous. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop the video there and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. So let me move back to Zoom and stop our share um, and bring myself up. Oops, and uh, your challenge, I forgot to show you guys the challenge. Uh, your challenge for the day is to go outside. If you can't go outside, look through the window and see if you can observe um, different animals, whether they're birds, squirrels, your neighbor's dogs or cats. Um, and describe their motion. So how are they moving? What is their speed? What is their trajectory? Uh, so there's lots of things around you that are always in motion. So we're gonna go ahead and pass it back to Mr. Broughton and he's gonna answer any questions that y'all might have. Thank you, Mr. Ramirez. I'm gonna share my screen one last time here to do a quick recap of what we uh, did today. So again, today's uh, virtual field trip was called Force in Motion. During this virtual field trip, students discovered that force, motion, and energy are related and are part of everyday life. Students predicted how a magnet can be used to push or pull an object and observe the ways that objects can move. Um, I think that the, the last slide should have got a little stuck, but I think you got the idea. Um, so first we explored forces with Mrs. Fuller, and again, those are a push or a pull, and gravity is something that pulls you down to Earth's surface. Uh, next, we explored magnets with, with Mr. Monroe and learned that the Earth is a giant magnet. Uh, third, we talked about the locations of an object. They can be next to or beside, above, below, in front of or behind um, another object. And last, we saw the way, way ob ways objects can move, so fast or slow, back and forth, round and round, all kinds of different ways. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we would like to know what you think about today's virtual field trip, and you can let us know by going to www.tiny.cc slash EEC feedback, and there you will fill out a short feedback form um, to let us know what you thought about today's trip. We do read those and um, use comments and suggestions to improve what we do here. We hope to see you again in about three weeks. Have a great rest of your day, and we'll see you next time. Goodbye.